So hopefully all of you are ready for this session, this live event called Structure and Discipline, Killer Ways to Get Better Results in, uh, in Sales. And I'm totally sure that all of you out there, you are either salespeople or your sales managers, sales directors, GMs or whatever, responsible for developing sales. And that's actually exactly what we're gonna talk about today. I'll start with a quote from a professor in the US, a professor who actually told me this story. He went into his audience, his uh, students, and he asked them a couple of questions. These students were all students in sales and marketing. And he asked them, do you believe in luck? And then uh, a lot of them said, yeah, we do believe in luck. Uh, we, sometimes you need to be lucky. Then he asked them, very interesting, do luck believe in you? And then some of them took down the hand and said, I don't really know if luck believes in me. And then it's a problem, you see, uh, because you believe in luck, but luck don't believe in you. Then we have a bottom mindset. Then he asked them a question more. Do you believe in luck in sales? And then a lot of them said, yes. And then he said, the last, the fourth question. So when you're successful in selling, you want to be uh, called lucky? And then they said, no. And that's actually what I want to do today. We have to stop imagining and believing that sales is about luck. Of course, sometimes situations are better or worse. We all know we have crisis somewhere in Europe. We have crisis around the world. We have good times somewhere. But these are circumstances we can do nothing about. And I wouldn't ever trust in luck in sales. Sometimes things are better or worse, but not luck. So by this, welcome to this session where we're going to eliminate the talk about luck and sales because we can actually plan how to be successful. But it, there is a big if here. If we have to be successful, we need to be disciplined and structured. And that's sometimes one of the big things here, being disciplined and structured. Oh, it seems so boring. It seems so strange, but we're going to work with it today. But it can be very fun, especially fun when we succeed. I'll come back to that a little later. And by this entrance, very much welcome to the next 60 minutes, talking about success in selling, structure, and discipline, and how we can work with it. I'll start totally out of scope with sales. And I might, I might touch somebody uh, in this case, but I'm going to tell you a little story about these two guys I have here on my flip chart. These guys are called Tim and Tom. Tim and Tom are two uh, persons here. As you can see, they are a little different in the shape. We have uh, a Tim. Tim has a situation where he would actually like to get rid of 30 kilo. He knows it's not a good situation for him. He knows he has to do something. And on the other hand, we have Tom. Tom here, he's real muscle. He's a muscle machine. And he wants to go for being number one in Mr. Universe. He wants to hit number one. The funny thing is, it's actually the same resource they're gonna work with. It's their body. One of them didn't take so much care of it. Another one took really good care of it. And that developed the bodies into two different shapes. Now they wanna hit different goals. This is just like state departments. Sometimes we have a bad situation we need to change, or we have extreme good situation that we need to, to do even better. But the funny thing is, it's exactly the same tool. It's exactly the same activities that should bring them to their goal. I'll explain to you what I mean. Explain to you that to reach these goals, which are the goals they're heading for, to get results, these two guys, they need to focus on two main things. What do I eat and how do I exercise? It's actually pretty easy. That is the main goal for each of them to reach less try, uh, 30 kilo and Mr. Universe number one. But to do that, they have to focus on the food, the living, the exercise, exactly the same. One of them do it because he wants to gain more muscle, the other one to get of fat. So first of all, what they have to look at is they have to look at their activities. Activities meaning uh, what do I actually do every day? How much do I practice? That means we're going to look into a quality, uh, sorry, quantity, uh, quantity here, meaning that how much do I train? 
How much do I eat? How often do I eat? How often do I practice? So they need to go into this. Second part is they need to go into a prioritization. A prioritization saying, what is my priorities in life? How do I prioritize my day, my time, my everything? And if they do that in a good way, not a fanatic way, but in a good way, if they do that in a good way, they can reach their goals. That means, first of all, they have to look at the effort to go there because without any effort, they're not gonna do it. For sure, both of them will have what they call luck or unluck. Unluck, they'll be invited for a party, even with beers and cake and roast and all that kind, that is not good for any of them. But the problem is not the invitation, the problem is the discipline and structure because you can go to a party and still behave in a good way. So effort is the first part. The other part is effect. That means these two guys, they can go to the gym multiple times, but if the effect of their training, the power of their training is not good enough, then they're wasting time. So at the same time, as they look at quantity and quotation, they also have to look at quality. What exercises do I do and how strong, with what kind of intensity, with what degree of quality, what is my knowledge to do it? What food should I eat? They need to put in quality. And in case they can put in quality, quantity and rotation, they can create better results. Better results meaning less kilo, more muscle, better life. The funny thing is they can both get a plan a plan from a fitness coach, a plan from anybody else. They can put a structure plan, but there's only one person to stick to the plan. That's Tim or Tom. So here we are actually talking about if I want to reach a result, I need to focus on one thing more. I need to focus on my mindset. What is my attitude towards this? How will I handle it? How should I be able to do this? Because the plan will be in my mind and I will hate part of it and I'll love part of it. That means I have to create the right state of mind. State of mind here is two things. First of all, what's in my head about this and what is my emotional state of mind? Do I really want to do it? And most likely, I don't know it, most likely there are two different views of why they want to do this. Tim, he wants to lose fuel to avoid getting sick, to make sure he not died too early. And the other guy, he wants to achieve a goal. So one of them is there to avoid, the other one there is to achieve. But for Tim, he might also achieve a better life living with his grandchildren when he gets old. And for Tom, he might also avoid not winning and the, the shame of not winning. So that means, all this means, the same two guys here can actually use the same structure, but they have to have the discipline to go there. And by this introduction about Tim and Tom, and then somebody will say, Matt, where are you myself? We all know how difficult this is because it's take a killer discipline and a great structure to go there. I'm going to show you how you can use exactly the same structure and discipline in your sales. But if you already start saying, yeah, but it's boring, or I don't really want to, then you'll get nowhere. And then you'll just stick to what I started saying. You can be lucky or unlucky. And if you succeed, remember, if you get bad results and you said it was unluck, then you should definitely also be ready to say, if you get good results, that you were lucky. And unfortunately, I very often hear sales people, sales departments, sales teams saying, we did so well, I created bad, good, really good results, the best results, we were amazing. And one year after, results are not really good. We are unlucky at the moment. Sorry guys, it doesn't help. We have to be disciplined, structured and take responsibility. Then if we take responsibility, it might be out of our hands what happened around us. And by this, let's look into sales. Because exactly like these two bodies, we can start talking about this now. We can start talking about what is a body in a sales department. 
is there anybody in the sales department? Yes, there is. There is a body. And I'm not talking about your salespeople. That's one of the first things. If you really want success, change your mindset. You are not the important part, dear sales guy or sales rep, sales manager. You are not the important guy. The customers are the important guys. The customers are the, those that are the resource that we're going to grow. That is actually our body. And what do I mean by this? In any sales department, what you see here is the body of the sales department. That is the strength of the sales department. So now you can just start evaluating yourself. Do we have a Tim or Tom structure body in our sales department? Do we have, are we going to get rid of killers or are we about to be Mr. Universe? I don't know what you want to be, but anyway, this is the first evaluation. And it takes part here. The first axis here is talking about customers. That means we evaluate because the result we create comes from how many customers do we have. That is the first part. That is also very often called the customer mix. We can talk here about a lot of customers. Maybe we have, let's just put up here, we have 100 customers. These customers, we can segment into A, B, C. Very often sales organizations do that. And very often they put it into A, B, and C customers, depending on how much revenue we get from them. Mistake number one. That's okay. That can mean something about how important they are today. But it makes no sense how important they could be in the future. So what should we do? I'll come back to that. First part is to look at what I call the C mix, the customer mix. 100 customers, is that good or bad? Are they all just as important as the others? This job we have to look at, just like we look at the bodies for Tim and Tom, we have to look at this here. How many customers do I have in my portfolio? In some companies, I know companies where a sales guy has three customers and I have other companies where I work with them, they have my, maybe 500. I work with banks where they have 700 families to take care of. That changes something about the structure and the discipline and the way we can work. That's the first part here. The first part is the customer mix. Then to create a result here, then we have to look at another part called the P mix, product mix. And what is a product mix? Very often people say, that is the portfolio of products we have or services we have. No, it's not. A product mix is your best way of handling your portfolio, meaning, if we have five products and we are only selling three, then we are losing potential of two of them. So the product mix is not the portfolio. It is how well we do with the portfolio. So the product mix actually now turns into, if we have here in this case, a product called X, Y, Z, and one more called U, we have four products. How much of these products do we sell to each customer? That means now we can see, and I think in all of your organizations, you have products that don't sell. And you have products that, so to say, sell themselves. That means the customers are buying them. You're not even selling them. They are ordering them. So don't take, don't take the, 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 the uh, great opportunity to tell you're successful because customers are just ordering this. So here, first of all, when you look at the result that you create, in a period, it can be in a month, in a week, in a year, because we are very soon, in only three months, we are ending 2022. So this could actually be your result in 2022, created by how many customers and how much did they buy from me? Now you are to plan 2023, and this is just about to be now. What should happen with our body the sales portfolio, this is called the sales platform. What should happen in 2023? How should it look when we're in 23? That means just like these two guys, I have to look at my body. I have to look at my platform saying, do I have too many customers? Do I miss customers? Do I sell enough? What kind of product do I sell all the time? What kind of product do I never sell? That means you have to start saying my growth in 2023, from where should it come? We have some options. We can grow by having new leads. 
new business. Very, very often I see a growth is always talking about getting new leads because we think that new business is the only way to grow. Very often what happens is that the growth comes the way that we, are, we go out and attack, we get the customer, and unfortunately at the same time we lose some. That means that's another part to look at. Maybe Tim wanted to lose kilos, but we don't want to lose customers. And if we lose customers, we definitely want to lose the right ones. Just like Tim, he wants to lose fat, not muscle. That means we have to look at this. Building our 2023 platform, should we go for new leads? Should we stop losing them? And if we go for new leads, what kind of segment should we go for? ABC clients, what kind of clients is the preferred, so to speak, what is a dream customer or client for us? Because talking about luck and not luck, if you reach out for the right customers, you might end up with the right customers. If you reach out for the wrong customer, you'll definitely end up with the wrong customer if you're lucky or unlucky, depends on how you see it. So here, start prioritizing. Do I have enough clients? Um, am I losing some? Should I get more? And then back to what I said, talking about ABC customers. Very often I hear people speak about ABC customers the way saying, oh, we have some A clients. Great, why are they A clients? Because they, the revenue of these is above 1,000, okay? And then if they are below 1,000, then they're B, and below 500, then they're C, and below 100, they're D, okay? So you talk about how much they're buying from you when you actually divide your customers into groups. Yes, okay? Why don't you look at what I call the potential? Because the potential is much more interesting because potential is the future. What they do, revenue, is what they do today. There might be a good chance that bigger clients and customers, we can grow with them, but potential is, how can I actually grow my portfolio next year? And maybe I should start saying, what of my customer portfolio, which five to 10 customers are the most important to grow with? Where is the potential? That means, even that I buy for more than a thousand today from your company, it might be a better customer just buying 400 today because potential is bigger. That's why if you divide them here, I would always divide them into what I call A, 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 B, A, C. That means if we can put one more letter, we talk about revenue as the first letter and potential as the second letter. That means, AA is a customer that's actually a very important customer for our revenue today, but A also means they are extremely important for the future. On the other hand, I might end up with what I call a C, C customer. They're not having a big revenue today and potential is not really good. And then the next part is, how often do you evaluate and change the classification of a customer? Very rare because they end up buying, and when they buy, they classified. This is what we, how we see them. So here is a job to do, just like Tim and Tom on this page, looked at their bodies, put up the goals and said, I want to do something different in 2023. I want to get rid of 30 kilos, or I want to be Mr. Universe, being the strongest man in the world. That's like, you have to look at your body in sales. Your body is, how many customers how much do they buy? What is the potential in the market? And what is the potential in my customers? And then we can add on one more thing. Because this one, I'll put one more thing. This platform uh, strategy is probably, in my opinion, I've been working 30 years now with, with, with developing sales organizations. And this strategy or tactic here, it's actually more tactic, uh, is one of the most simplest models to do sales development. But it's most one of the most valuable because what it actually now does, it tells us where should you focus. That means 
if 2023 is going to be the year of new leads, then let's focus here getting new leads. Is 2023 is the year of more potential, and really getting a yield from the potential and for potential. If year 2023 is stopping customers running away from us, but very often happen when we get new leads, we onboard them bad and they leave again. A lot of you might remember the infinity loop in which I talk about the glasses, how we see the world, new business, existing business. I'm not gonna go into this today, but if anybody wants to hear more about it, you're lucky because this is actually exactly, yes, the infinity loop. The infinity loop is the customer journey and how we meet the customers and where we do our efforts to do this. We're not gonna go into it today, but if any of you is more interested in this, I can definitely recommend you. I know also my, uh, my colleague, Mark and Vyom, they will share here that I'm doing a two-day workshop in Dubai in January. This two-day workshop is a sales booster for 2023. And for that, you'll be ready. You'll do some exercises before you arrive. That means you have Christmas and New Year to do it. And then you arrive for a two-day workshop where you'll plan your success for 2023. Not believe in luck, but planning what should bring us to a higher level in 2023, whatever happens here. So we talk about the infinity loop, where should we focus? And then we have to look at this one, the relationship, the strength of loyalty, relationship and loyalty. How satisfied are our customers? That means what I can do now is I can make it a three-dimensional portfolio, meaning that my job, anybody in a company's job is to take care of, do we have the right clients? Can we keep them in the company? Do we sell enough? Do we know their potential? And are we close connected to them? How often do we do efforts? And don't put it now. I know salespeople very often say, oh, we have this one, that's for service. No, it's not. It's for anybody in the company. We are all responsible for this platform. And if anybody believes that it's only, that it's only the sales department, then they're wrong. And if sales department believe it's only them, then they're wrong. This is responsibility for the company, but we have, might have different uh, tasks to do to reach this. So what I see very, very often is that people don't spend time on this because now we can use it for planning. Planning for what? Just like Tim and Tom, we can plan, is this about losing kilos or gaining muscle? Or is it about both? So actually we can put this exactly like Tim and Tom they did. We can put it down to this one, talking about our effort, quantity, and rotation. And let's go into that to start with. I'll give you a small story now, because very often I hear from uh, sales people, oh, prioritization is very difficult. Yes, but there's only one reason that prioritization is difficult. That's your discipline and your structure. It's easy to prioritize, but it's more difficult or more challenging to do it, to stick to the behavior, the agreed behavior that we really want to have. So what we're looking for here is, we're looking for a plan and we're looking for discipline to stick to the plan. Is it possible? Yes, it is. I'll give you a small example why prioritization is so important. This is also a small story from an American professor. He had his students in the, com in the, in the group, in the school, in the classroom. That day he put up two glass balls. He put them up at the table and then he put some boxes with stones, sand, wan, uh, water, small stones, bigger stones and all that stuff. And then he uh, asked the people, the group of people, do you believe that all this stuff can be in the glass bowl? Most of them said no. Some of them said, yes, maybe we don't know. Then he started doing this. He took the sand and he put the sand in the glass bowl. And then he asked them, do you think we can have more stuff in this one? And they said, no, we cannot. Not even the stone will be because they will fall out. And then he said, maybe we can pour a little water. And he put some water, but very fast the water flow over and was spilled on the table. And he said, the problem here is not the sand and the glass ball. It's our prioritization and our discipline. Let's change it, he said. So let's go to this one. 
He took the other glass bowl exactly the same way. And then he started taking the five big stones. He put them in and he asked, is there room for any more in this glass? Some people said, no. Some said, yeah, maybe. And then he took the medium sized stone and put them down and they all rolled down and filled out some of the holes here. And then he asked, is there room for more? People said, maybe. And he took the small stones and the small stones, they all tumbled down and filled out the small spaces. And now they were in the, in the glass bowl. And then he asked, do we have room for more? Yeah, maybe some said. He took the sand and he put it in the sand here. And the sand just, as the fine sand just went down through all the minor ho holes and spaces and empty places and sand was in the bowl. And then he took the water and he put in water and water were running down. And then in the end, it flew over. What is the difference here? The difference is rotation. The way we prioritize here is that we do the right rotation. And what has this to do with sales? These five big stones, if we don't start with them, they will ne never ever fit into the glass bowl. And this is exactly like life, life in a real sales department. These big stones is what we call our big rocks. And what does big rock mean? That means in some kind, you could call it our must win battles. These are the things we gonna win every time because if we don't win them, we will not win 2023 strategy and tactics. So big rocks here, that can be new business. That means if a big rock next year is new business, then we need to plan for it. We need to schedule it. We need to structure it. We need to practice it. Come back to that a little later. It could also be our major accounts because I could imagine that all of you sitting out there, you have a client portfolio where at least 10 bigger clients could have a lot more revenue, but they don't get it because you don't treat them as big rocks. You tell us they're important because they're classified as A or A plus customers, but you don't make a plan how to grow them. And if they grow now, it's not because of you, it's because of them. But how will you make them grow? I'll come back to that a little later. It could also be our medium-sized customers, meeting, meaning that medium-sized customers has the best potential or they're most realistic for our product. So why focus on the bigger ones? I work with a client right now, and as they said, we are by far the best in the market of medium-sized businesses, okay? Why then focus on bigger companies? Because you're gonna waste time and time is your best friend and your worst enemy. So why focus on this? Because it's waste of time doing it when you're better to the medium size, go there. It could also be that we have to focus on building stronger relationship, meaning more satisfied customers. You don't know what is your big rocks for 2023 and you will never reach them. So first one here is to prioritize our big rocks. That means if we should succeed in rotation, we need to focus on big rocks. Second part then is how to structure our work to do it with quantity and rotation. I'll give you one example here. I work with one of Europe's biggest banks. I work with the investment managers. And what is happening right now, they're working with different kind of clients. Some is what they call the high net, really, really wealthy uh, clients. They have some a little less down, not so wealthy. They have what is called the affluent clients. They are medium sized, small clients. Of course, some of the small clients can grow to be bigger. Then we're back to classification, potential. You could be classified an affluent, but you can actually grow to be a high net. You could also be a high net actually scaling down to be an affluent. But what changes? Do we change our focus? Do we do it the right way? What's interesting here is exactly the same way these investment managers have like 50 clients. 
these 50 clients are divided into high net, uh, wealthy clients, affluent, potential like that. And we know one thing, we need to focus more on the high net right now. Interesting thing is, now they decided to make a plan, to make a plan, I'll just change the blue color here because it's not that good, they want to make a plan for the high net customers. Each high net customer should be kept in the company, they couldn't go out of the platform, and we want to reach a little more potential because they can see that these clients who are wealthy still have more money. So if I can have more money to, to, to the bank, I get more asset under management, better portfolio. So they want to grow on two places here. They want to grow on the relationship to the big clients, and they want to grow on getting more potential out of these. So what we need to do, first of all, one of the one of the advisors, he has 25 of these high net work clients. 25, what is interesting is they have now decided that the structure for this is that a high net customer should have at least four planned activities a year, four touch point with the bank, at least four. Now we're not talking about a five minute call, an email, a spontaneous, we're talking about the planned part, the planned part to grow the business. The planned part is also like this. Talking about big rocks, this is a big rock. The planned part is also that these meetings should be like in beginning of year or sometimes a strategy meeting to talk about what should happen in 2023, a follow-up meeting, an analysis meeting where we actually look down at the portfolio, see how it's going, evaluate, and a follow-up. This is the minimum, the minimum touch point these clients should have. In between, there might be something happening. But the problem is, looking exactly at these drawings, that when an advisor, investment manager, when he starts his morning, somebody pours sands, sand into his glass, meaning that instead of focusing on big rocks, he start speaking to those clients who send an email. He starts speaking to those who are calling. He starts speaking to those he liked the most. He starts speaking to what happened. That means he leaves control of his sales to exactly who calls him, who speaks to him, who reach out, or who does he like, who likes him most to be in a meeting with. And some of them are not favorites of the high net clients. So actually now they leave control of their success in selling and customer relation, they leave it to the clients. They leave it to circumstances. Just like if I go back here, this is like Tim and Tom. Let's try to imagine, they both have to do a job. And when they go to work, they're so lucky that there's a breakfast. In the, in the morning in the office, somebody serves breakfast, but they serve scrambled egg, bacon, Nutella, bread, butter, juice. It's really bad for Tim and it's really bad for Tom. But since somebody served it, we better have to eat it. No, you don't. Tim and Tom, you have to plan your success. That means you take responsibility for your big rocks. And responsibility for your big rock might mean that I am in control of my breakfast. I'm in control of my food. And I'm in control of my customers. That means you could really have a situation where you plan, how do I do this? And then again, remember I said, one of the guys here, he has 25 big clients. 25 big clients should meet four times. That's 100 meetings. 100 meetings, let's just say we have around 45 weeks of work a year, even if I said 50. It's at least two meetings, planned meetings a week. And we all know what happened. If you have none of these meetings in January, you have the summertime, it's impossible. Might be that Christmas is difficult. So very fast you end up with having very few weeks 
actually to plan your sales for these 25 most important customers. I think some of you out there are sitting exactly now thinking, wow, this is what's happening for me. Yes, because you don't take structured discipline about your own customers and how you want to approach them, then they take control of you and you are like, it's a little like the dark. Is it the dark waving with the tail or the tail waving with the dark? I see a lot of salespeople, they think they're in control, but they're not. So what we learned here is we need to work with what I call a dream calendar. And I'll just put it with a five day working. And of course, I know somebody will say, oh, we work more days. No problem. You just put six blocks here. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If I know that I'm going to have 100 meetings with the big rocks, then I need to have at least two, maybe three meetings a week with the big rocks. OK, great. Then let's plan. I want one of these meetings to be on the Monday, one to be on the Wednesday, and one to be on the Friday. Perfect. That's the first part. Because then I blocked it and said, these are for big rocks. These are for the most important customers. Great. What else? I need to follow up on the second biggest. OK, when do you follow up? I'll do that Monday morning. I might do that Tuesday afternoon. I might do it Thursday. I put in blocks for the second most important things. And then I put in, and that's also interesting. What you see here is very often most of us, and now you can, you can be honest, when you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing you do? Is it say good morning and kiss your wife or your husband? Or is it checking your phone? If it's checking your phone, you already lost control of your life. Because what happened now is there's a WhatsApp message, a messenger and text and email, and suddenly somebody is starting to control your life. You have to stop that because what you have to do is saying, I don't need to control it so fast. I, I don't need to check my phone so fast. And second, even if there's something that is in there, they're not urgent, all of them. Urgency means that I have to do it right now. Try to imagine that what I do is actually, I put in a block for following up what has come in my inbox. That means I put in blocks. But what's happening now, right now is the phone and the email and the WhatsApp takes control of my life. So I'm, I'm doing everything at the same time. That means, first of all, I might not make any plan. That means I'm losing my most important meetings with the big rocks. Secondly, I get stressed. I get less presence. And that means I'm actually not really being there in the meetings with the client. And if the client feel that, then it's already a bad situation for me. That means I have to take control of my own life. I don't care if you check your phone in the morning. But since you check it, you don't need to start doing actions. Because if you plan your life right, what will happen here is I know what to do. It might also be that I start evaluating. And I start, stop evaluating every time I start a week. How disciplined have I been? How structured have I been? And maybe I even do it together with one of my buddies, one of the other sales guys, the sales manager, the sales director, because we know if I do this, I'll have the right amount of meetings. There might also be that, just to put this in here, that I have time here for meetings. I work with a company where we have decided they are in situation. They should have five meetings a week. But we decided that they have the meetings on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. No meetings Friday, no meeting Monday, because these days are for planning. That means we have to be sure that there are five meetings every week. Just try to imagine that in one week, in the beginning, you have only three meetings. Then you're two down. Then the next week, you have to have seven. But you don't get it. You get four. Now you're three meetings down. Then the next meeting, you need to have eight. But you don't get it. You get only five. You're still three behind. Then you have a meeting with some cancellations. You only have four meetings. Now you're four meetings down. And that will follow. So this year, actually, you need to plan. You need to focus and you need to be disciplined. So evaluation of this is very important. And when do I actually sit down here and plan my next week? So what we come down to here is, how would I like my dream calendar to be? Because in case I can plan this, 
There might be things that not happening as successful as I want. There might happen something where somebody actually uh, bring an RFP that want a big offer or proposal right now. Yes, but I plan that I have time for this. It's not ruining my whole calendar. And I have companies where I work with them. They are constantly working behind schedule because somebody took control of their time. And we know time is the most uh, uh, most scary resource we have. It's also the most uh, important resource because somebody then tell me, oh, I didn't do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, that's perfect. But you're still using time tomorrow that you cannot, you cannot spend time you didn't do yesterday. Time is off when it haven't been used the right way. So you need to take control of this to plan more and be more structured. I don't care how you do it, but you cannot plan your week without having big rocks and priorities. And you need to agree on that in the sales department. And you may even need to agree this with your manager. And the manager needs to know what is important for the sales department. And the, the director needs to know what is important for the company. And it has to be aligned with this. So actually here, it's very important to understand that if you can control this, your like ability of having success is growing and increasing. Does this mean I'm 100% disciplined? Probably not. But try to imagine that you're 90% disciplined. Then you can change this uh, a, big, uh, a big time here. So what we talk about here is, now we also need to say, if I want this to happen, the first meeting in Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, okay? Why don't we sell the idea to the customer that they should actually make a plan with us where all dates are put in the calendar for a year? Does this mean that the client will not call us in Q3 and say, uh, sorry, I have to cancel, can we change? Of course we can change because I'm planning so much, I can change. Since if I'm not, not planning, I was always behind. So that means I can actually together with the client explain to them, the way we work with you is that we always plan for meetings ahead. That means it's so important for us that you get the right product, the right service at the right time. I could imagine it's also important for you, right? Yeah, sure it is. And if we don't speak together, what will happen then? Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't go through a portfolio. We don't get all the options, exactly. And how much is changing in your business every day? A lot, okay. So we need to speak regularly, right? Yes, we do. Four meetings, let's plan them now. We start with the strategy for the year, great. We follow up because things will change, yes. We have analysis to show what's happened. Is it going okay? Great. And then a follow up, getting ready for the coming year. That's the minimum touch points we have to have. Then of course, in between, we have what is called the daily ad hoc meetings where you reach out there's a problem, you need something. And then again, get this stuff away from the sales guys. I know in some departments, sales guys want to be a part of everything. But if they should have time for this, you need to find out who's actually responsible for the service part, who's responsible for reaching out for the clients. So here, first of all, you have to do this. And as Mark just is saying here, if some of you dare to have 45 minutes with me uh, challenging the way you prioritize and structure your work in the sales department, then uh, sign up and maybe be lucky or unlucky if you believe in luck that you can have a session with me for 45 minutes to look, are you doing the right things? But don't do it if you think there is a quick win here because these two guys, they're gonna have hard work to be number one or to lose kilo. This is the successful sales organization. And they know they have to be structured and disciplined and prioritized to keep on being successful. These are the, let's, let's just call it the fat cow that didn't realize that you are now in a situation where you might think that you're doing well. And right now is the most dangerous time of all. Most of you, definitely here in the Middle East, a lot of you is in a situation where, whoa, we're doing good. Yeah, but did you really realize that everybody right now is doing good? There's a high price level, inflation, high level of activity, but how do you actually make sure that your body, your sales portfolio will be ready for, sorry to say, bad times? So here we have already now to get ready for not so good times. And the first part is to get structured and have 
the way to do the right efforts. To do this, one of my quick tips for you is to look into a sales playbook. Mark will share a link where you can start doing your sales playbook. And what do we do in the sales playbook? We do actually define the strategy. That's where we want to grow. The tactics, how will we structure and prioritize? And the minute we have this, we can use it for evaluation. Just like any sports team have a kind of a concept for the way they want to play. They have a structure for the way they work. They're disciplined about it. They do their physical training, the tactical training, the mindset training. That's the same here. First of all, start creating your playbook by designing your way to success. And then don't just say, let's do the best we can and see how far we go. No, design what you want to do and how you see the success can be. And then not only look at the effort, but also look at the effect. Effect here is quality. What is the competences in our sales organization? And if we look at this, so many things have changed in the world. Customers can service themselves digital. They can get so much information. They don't want to see you in the same way as they used to. So we have to work with now saying, okay, where in my dream calendar and the prioritization should I put development where should i put my own development those sales guys not developing are slowly but steadily getting worth and worth and less relevant for the customers those sales guys constantly and con conscious developing themselves they'll be relevant and valuable for the customers so what we train with this client here, train to imagine that you have to learn to sell the idea of having four meetings with a client. You could present it the way that for our company, it's really important to meet you four times a year. Great, the customer said, but it's not for me. You could also train how you actually practice and tell them the work with us, how important is it for you that it's getting value and it's actually developing the right way? How, is, how important is that for you, dear client? Oh, that's pretty important. Okay, if we should make sure that you reach the goals you wanna reach, how often do you think we should speak together? Oh, we should of course be able to speak when I need it. Sure, sure, but sometimes when you need it, we don't know how often that is. Maybe we could speak, try to imagine we could speak before you need it. Wow, that's interesting, is that possible? Our experience actually shows that it is. When we have a structured plan, and of course we have room for these coming up things. And what we see is there are four important touch points. The first one is, how often do you see anybody succeed if they have no plan? Oh, that's not happening very often. No, it's not. So first we need to meet and make the plan for the year. Great. Then when we do a plan, do things change? Yes, they do. Great, so we need to have a meeting for follow-up? Perfect. And then in the middle of everything, we do an evaluation. How well are we doing? What are you happy about? What are we happy about? How can we develop more? Is that valuable just to stop arm and have a reflection? Sure it is. Great, we have to do that. And then in the end, when year comes to the end, let's already now plan a follow-up meeting to see, did we actually succeed with the strategy? How often have you seen that you have decided to evaluate once a year? But unfortunately, it's always postponed, postponed, postponed. And that's not a good start for the coming year. So here, of course, the follow-up meeting is very important to do the new strategy that we do right after business or new year. So that's why we have at least four touch points that are planned. And if I put them in my calendar and you put them in your calendar, what will happen then? Yeah, then we are likely to, uh, to keep to the schedule. Sure. And if we don't put them in, try to imagine I call you now and say, I want a meeting with you. When can you meet? <laughs> it's going to take three weeks. Exactly. So we have to plan it now. It's easier for you. It's easier for me. And that's why you need to do this. That's why we're talking about account plans, customer plans. What is the activities? So we could actually go one step further here and below the dream calendar, build up my planning with each account. And that means it should be 12 months and maybe two, two less here. But try to imagine, this is account number, we just call it account number one. This is my customer. These are the planned meetings. And then beside that, 
I know they have a potential here. I might be selling machines, but they have no service agreement with me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find out, that is my goal. I'm gonna find out who is responsible for service. Also, I know that they are planning projects for the future. I need to find out who is responsible for these projects. And what I need to do is, when I have the first meeting, I need to speak a little with them about to set up a dialogue with the service guy and the project guy. Because I need to bring in maybe a couple other people from my company. And these guys should meet so we can have maybe an access here to speak with them about upcoming projects. Because if we can speak earlier about projects, we are in a situation we can be ahead. And very often, I hear very often that people speak about, we want to be partner. We want to be partner with our clients, right? A partner always think ahead. A supplier just deliver when they ask. So if you very often is so lucky that you have RFPs because they reach out, then you have to change it to be a partner. And then you are ahead already knowing what's going on in 2023. Because try to imagine that on your table, on the Monday, hits four emails with four RFPs, request for proposal. Four companies reach out for you. Are they all as important or are some of them more important than others? How should you prioritize if you have no big rocks, small rocks, sand and water? This is impossible. And what happens now is, your prioritization goes from what I call brightness and cleverness to the heart. That means you're now prioritizing by heart. And that is a really huge problem because what happened now is you're reaching out for those you want to reach out and not those who are the most important for the body of the company. That's what you should do. You should prioritize. Actually, you might even be in a situation where you should say, sorry, we're not able to reach out for this RFP. We cannot even bid. We can do it, but right now we're in a situation that the price is going to be too high. But then sometimes you reach out and you win it, but you win the wrong one. You don't win the right one. So we we'll have to decide, do I want to take control of my own sales and sales department, or do I, do I just want to live from what is coming here? And if you have no, no part of this, you're not a partner. You're a simple supplier. And a simple supplier is competing on price. They're competing on conditions. Partners, they compete because they are related, close related to their customers. And I'll show you here some levels of relationship. Since what we talk about here is, we talk about how to, how to classify our customers. Another way to classify is, what kind of relationship? We talk about the last axis here, the relationship axis. What kind of relationship do we have? Here are four levels of relationship. These levels are relevant to understand, to classify and plan my work with my customers. They are divided into four steps here. These four steps, can grow on two things. They can grow on what is called the business axis, meaning how much business and what do we speak about when we are working with the clients. The, thing, the second part is the personal connection to the people I'm speaking to. Can I actually help them to get promoted, successful? Do I know them? Do they open up? That means if I can grow from a low connection on the personal level, to a high connection, I move the relationship. If I can grow from a low conversation about their business, their strategy, their plans, I can grow to a high, I get better connection. And here we talk about a business connection and a personal connection. And let me show you these four levels here. The first level of relationship is called service-based relationship. Service-based is very much they ask you some questions, you explain. You spend a lot of time explaining products, services, and they ask a lot of questions. You very often get emails, you explain, phone calls, you explain 
you're always behind, you're reactive. You're not proactive, you're reactive. That means the sales guy has transformed from being a future successful partner into being just a service provider of information. That will happen with some uh, customers, some uh, different contact persons. And if your life is there, you lost the proactivity, you're into reactivity. You can change that. But it takes that we need to grow here. Second part is better, but not really good. Here, you're talking about a need-based relationship. Need-based means that you speak a lot with the clients about their needs, but you speak with them about the needs when the need is there. They're not just reading out to have comments about products. They're now reaching out saying, I think we're gonna change our solution. Do we have time to speak about it? And we speak a lot about what is their need? How should the machine be? How, how much quantity they need? So we speak about actually what they need, now, need right now. But still, we are on the lowest level of relationship. And this relationship is very easy to supplement us. It's easy to change us. And what we're talking about here is, it's a supplier relationship. That is the relationship I have with a lot of these people providing something for my house. I reach out when I need a new garden, new tiles, renovation, uh, cleaning of windows. I reach out, I have a need. I don't love them, I'm satisfied, but I'm only having a supplier. I don't have a partner. But how often do some of them go into my house and tell, we see there's more things here. What is the next plan you have, Max? Do you, do you want to grow something else? Do you want to change something else? And they ask actually about other things than just doing what they should do. And then we can go to the third level. The third level, when we are here, we are actually getting into what is called a trusted business advisor. And what is a trusted business advisor? That is somebody who understands my business, who really wants to understand how they can develop my business and how they can help me to go to the next level. They're interested in what is going on in my company. They're interested about the strategy, the future, your pains, your gains. Just like if I should be the, the trusted fitness coach of these two guys, I should not only know why he wants to lose 30 kilos, I should know also really about why is it important? What could happen for him? How can I help him? And for this guy, not only that he wants to be number one, also why he wants to be it. What is actually, his, why is it so desirable for him? And if I can go to this level, I'm changing from being a supplier to being a trusted advisor. And trusted advisor means that I'm in a situation where they don't speak with me only about a need. They also speak about a plan. And if I can go to the highest level, I can be what is called a trusted personal advisor. And now I also speak about what is the stake for the person? What is in it for him or her? What is their situation? What is, how do they see themselves in this? Sometimes we get there by coincidence. But if I want to plan to go there, I need to go much, much further. And I'll give you one example. Right now, I really love it. A lot of you guys are trying to present solutions in my chat. Remember guys, you're just trying to impress people to buy blockchain or Bitcoin or something else. And actually what is happening is that your credibility goes down because those people see you here will probably say, can I really trust that guy because he's just sneaking in on mats, trying to present things in his chat. So if I was you, I would never do it because your credibility, your reliability goes down. Who would do business with somebody who sneaks up in another live event just to present the product, try to take attention? And if you cannot do else than that, I don't think your business is sustainable for the future. You're probably just in for a short time. So what I would recommend you is to sit down and try to imagine how will you develop your uh, sales? instead of just sneaking into a live event, trying to spread something and hoping to be lucky. You're not planning your success. You're just lucky or unlucky. And that's one of the things that you have to understand. 
we have to look at ourselves, our behavior, because these two bodies have been created in the past because of bad behavior and good behavior. If I want to change, the new bodies are created because of good behavior, right behavior, prioritized behavior. And that is exactly the point in selling. So today what we've been through here is start analyzing your platform, start planning how to get success in 2023, put up your big rocks, get ready to get the right effort, quantity, rotation, and put in the right quality. In case you do this, you have the chance to be more successful, not by luck or coincidence, but because of structured discipline and rotation. And for those of you who really wants to know more about what's happening in January, two days workshop, physical workshop, where you can come yourself, you can come a group of people from your company, and then you can really work on your business plan for 2023 or your sales plan, your account plans. And when you leave after two days, you're more ready to have success in 23 than you were before coming. And that is actually my point to you. Take control of your success in selling by being more structured, more disciplined, and of course, hard work. And I really hope you enjoyed being here. Time is now 12.01 in my region. That means one minute over time. I really enjoy being here. I hope you did. And uh, to all of you, see you wherever you are. Reach out if you want to speak more. Be successful, structure and prioritize your life. Take care.